Yeah. Um, well, uh, if you didn't notice already, the uh, I did grade and post the tests from um, earlier this week. Overall, they were fine, pretty good. Um, I'll go. I'm gonna tell everybody's taken them. There have been a couple of people that are ab that were absent on the test day that are, I think, have an extended absence situation going on. So. It could be a little bit before they get back, but I wanted to make sure at least I got them graded and scored and in on the computer. Um, and again, like if you are particularly curious about something that you did or you want to see something, like I'm fine to, you know, set up an appointment and let you take a look at it and talk about it or whatever with you. Um, but in terms of like students still needing to make up the test, I don't want to release any of them. Um, until they're all made up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the responses. That helps. Um, so today we're going to be starting chapter two. And chapter two is about all about absolute value functions. This is going to be a pretty quick chapter, like I would guess two days of lecture and then we're basically going to be done with it. Um, in general, I, I think that this chapter is usually considerably easier than the previous one as it's much less abs it's much less abstract than the previous chapter and we're going to be doing things that resemble more like the mathematics skills that you're accustomed to. Um, in general, the rest of this, most of the rest of this course is going to be a survey of functions. And for each different function group, we're going to be primarily concerned with four skills. So we're going to be concerned with simplifying what are the rules algebraic rules I have and the way I can manipulate this function. Solving, how can I solve equations involving this specific type of function? Graphing, how do I graph these functions? And then modeling, how do I go from some information about the function or a graph of the function and create an equation? But these are gonna be basically the same four skills we're gonna be seeing over and over and over again. Um, we're just going to be looking at them with a different function kind of in mind. Okay with that idea? So part of chapter or this first chapter was kind of getting up to speed on some of the notation that we're going to use over and over again and some of the terminology and these sorts of things that are going to occur over and over and over again. Um, but it will be more specific because most of the time we'll just be directing that terminology or notation at a specific function rather than like a general f of x. So usually things get a little bit easier after that first chapter for students. Okay? Okay. Um, so let's talk about absolute values here. If you were to give me a explanation of what an absolute value does, what would you say? Yes, sir. Okay, how far the number is away from zero on the number line. That's actually a, one of the formal definitions for an absolute value, um, which is excellent that you remembered that. But probably practically, most of us don't think about the absolute value in that way, although that's a perfectly reasonable answer that you gave and actually a very technical and excellent answer. From a practical standpoint, though, if most of us are going to do algebra, what are we thinking about when we think about an absolute value? What does it do? Oh. Yeah, it just makes numbers positive, right? And that's, that's a fairly normal 
and very practical way of thinking about what the absolute value does. Um, there's actually three different definitions that we'll use um, that are technical. Now the technical definitions are going to be good for like developing a method or proving something or you know like kind of looking at something in a different way but they're usually not super practical when it comes to like doing a problem right we usually like to take the definitions and use them to build some kind of a method and then we'll use that method to actually do the problem where we're not actually working through the definition but the definitions are important for us at least as a building point to where we kind of construct these methods from. Now, uh, Evan? No. What's your name? You're Kevin. But the fellow that just answered my question a moment ago? Jack. Thank you. Jack um, has one of, for one of the formal definitions here, we're going to give two others that again can be helpful in justifying something or developing a method or whatever else. Um, another definition we have for an absolute value is the square root of a squared. Now if we think about that, when I square a number, what happens to it? It must be positive, right? And once the number is positive, well, I guess I should say non-negative, I can always take the square root of it, right? And I know the square root's going to cancel out the squared, and I'm going to be left with basically the absolute value of the number because the square root always returns a non-negative result also. Okay. And then the third definition that we have for an absolute value is a piecewise definition. So what a piecewise function is, or a piecewise definition is, is it's going to describe a function that behaves differently depending on the input or depending on the domain. So for an absolute value function, we don't want it to do anything if our input is non-negative, right? So if it's non-negative, just return the same thing as what it was. Now if that number is negative, we need the opposite sign. So to just kind of give you an example here, if I did the absolute value of three, so 3 is like my a because 3 is positive, it's greater than or equal to 0, that tells me that I should just get 3 back. If I did the absolute value of negative 2, well negative 2 is less than 0, so I should be doing the opposite of negative 2, which is positive 2. Do we kind of see how that piecewise function is working there? So you have to look at the input to figure out which definition for the function you're using. But this piecewise definition, it describes exactly what the absolute value is doing. Okay. Um, has everybody done at least something with, have seen the absolute value before, used it to do like trivial little things, maybe with a number or whatever? That's good. So let's talk about simplifying. And we're basically just going to make a do's list and a don'ts list. So do's are things that we can algebraically do, and don'ts are things that we can't algebraically do. So by algebraically do, we mean that this relationship is always true. 
The don'ts are going to be things that the relationship is not always true. Okay with that idea? So our first thing that is always true is that the absolute value of x times y is equal to the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y. Now, if you think about that for a moment, is that, are you, are you convinced that that's going to work? You should, right? If I have two negatives, if I multiply them together, I get a positive, and the absolute value of a positive is a positive. If I break those two negatives each into their own absolute value, the absolute value of each of those is positive, and positive times positive is positive. So I should be getting the same result there at the end, right? And you can kind of go through every iteration of negative or positive for the x's and y's and see that that'll always hold under every condition. Contrast that with something like this. So the absolute value of x plus y is not equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. We can see that where would the problem ha be here? What kind of values of x and y would get us in trouble? Well, if they're both negative, we're going to be OK. But if one is negative and one's positive, that's going to get us into trouble, right? Imagine if x is 5 and y is negative 4. The left-hand side would give us 1, and the right-hand side would give us 9. Is everybody OK there? Now, there are conditions when it will be true, but we don't care about that in mathematics. We need it to be always true all the time. Okay. Um, similarly, if we can break the absolute value at a multiplication symbol, we can surely break the absolute value at a division symbol because division is just multiplying by a reciprocal, right? Everybody's okay there? And if it doesn't work for addition, I surely can't break the absolute value with a subtraction then for the same reason. Yes. Sure. Uh, so I'm just going to pick a value for x that's positive and a value for y that's negative. So on the right-hand side, I would end up with 5. Right? 2 minus a negative 3 is positive 5. And then the absolute value of positive 5 is positive 5. If I go on the right-hand side, I'd have 2 minus 3 or negative 1. So it's not going to work, right? So anytime you have one that's positive and one that's negative, you're going to get into that same trouble there. Does that feel okay? Okay. Yeah, so that what, what we're saying is that this can't be further simplified. Right. That's what that's exactly what we're saying here. Similarly, this can't get further simplified. It just it is what it is. Um I guess we should number these two, huh? Yeah, I'll put a split down the middle.
And I'm going to do this here to really illustrate that what you can't do is distribute that A back inside of the absolute value. And this one is maybe a little surprising, right? This just looks like the distributive property. What, what's the situation where this is going to give us problems? What happens if A is negative? The left-hand side would give us a negative answer, right? Because we'd have a negative, the A, times the absolute value, which is positive. The right-hand side is just an absolute value. That has to be a positive. So we know that those couldn't be equal, right? So you can't distribute something inside of an absolute value. Here's a do. The absolute value of x squared is just x squared. Why is that true? Paul? Exactly. If I square something, it has to be positive anyways, so we don't need the absolute value around it because the squared is already positive. Right? You can't square something and get a negative. So that's fine. Um, that's all that sticks out in my mind here of things that I see students commonly making a mistake on. Let's just do a couple of numeric examples here and move on to the next topic here. Does that sound okay? So let's say we have the absolute value of negative 4x. Can we simplify this? Sure. Right? We know there's really a multiplication symbol going on between the 4 and the x. So I can do this. And what's the absolute value of negative 4? That's positive 4. And the absolute value of x, we can't do anything to simplify. So we just leave that as our final answer. Is everybody okay there? What if we have the absolute value of 2x minus 6? You can just leave it sitting on the floor yeah, over there. Oh, well, yeah, that'll, you know, or if you need to move to a different location to plug in, that's okay. Whatever you need to do. Yep. How about this one? Can we do anything here? Sure. Notice that there's a greatest common factor between the 2 and the negative 6. So we could do this. And that's multiplication going on between the 2 and the x minus 3. And we know the absolute value of 2 is just 2. And we can't do anything with the absolute value of a sum or a difference, so that's where we would stop. Does that feel okay to everyone? Let's do a sneaky one. So we have the absolute value of x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now, my expectation right now with this is that not everyone would even know what to do with this. And that's okay, because we haven't talked about quadratics in this class, and I don't expect you to come in knowing how to do quadratics already. But I suspect that one or two of us or more would know what to do with this. And that's okay. We'll go back, or when we will be doing this, dealing with quadratics shortly. So if you don't know what to do with this in a 
month or two, you're going to be well acquainted with something like this. What can we do with a quadratic? Paul? Uh, no, and that because what you're doing there is talking about doing something like this, right? But that's not an unreasonable idea. Jack. So we can do some factoring here. Now, it's not a greatest common factor because not all three of the terms have an x in it. But we can factor this quadratic. Um, now I, you have to tell me. It's not coming. Ava, thank you. Great. So we can factor this 1 times x plus 1, or as Ava said, x plus 1 squared. Now the way she did that is we found two numbers that multiplied to give us 1, and add to give us 2, well, provided that the leading coefficient is 1. So the two numbers that multiply to give us 1 and add to give us 2 is just positive 1 and positive 1. So that's the ones here. Basically what we've done is we undid foiling there. And if you've seen that before, that should look familiar. And if you haven't, that's okay. We'll do a lot of work on quadratics here in another chapter or two. Okay? All right. So we have this, and what can we do here? We can just call this x plus 1 squared. And if you wanted to, you could refoil that back out, but I don't see any reason to do that. Hold on. Now I've gotten confused because I want to, I, there's, you in the other class, somebody, okay, let me just guess. Amy. Okay. I use that. Does that feel okay? Uh-huh. Now, don't be concerned here. I do not expect that you guys are all able to do this right now. I would not ask you to do something similar to this on a test because we haven't talked about how to factor yet in this class, and that's not a considered prior knowledge. Some of us have that prior knowledge, which is fantastic. If you don't have it yet, don't worry. We'll do a lot of practice and we'll get you that knowledge here in another chapter too. But it's hard to come up with a um, nice example. That's not like silly obvious right at the start to use that. Okay. That's about all there is to simplifying with absolute values. We really just have a couple of rules. The big one is that if you have the absolute value of a sum or a difference, there's nothing really more you can do, right? You can't break up at the sums, at the pluses or minuses. So we're going to talk now about solving. So the first thing I want to do is identify possible solution sets. So let's say we have a very simple version of an absolute value equation where just the absolute value of x is equal to a. This is not my day. I'm telling you, you can just move to I like... Think it's working. I just keep it on and it's it up. It's not you can just move to another location where you don't have like that big of a stretch. It's fine. Do whatever you want. It's well, I'm sure I just keep dropping. Okay. 
I know I would be I'd be sick of it by now too if I were you. It seems really frustrating. Okay. So absolute value of x is equal to a. How many different kinds of solutions can we get for this? Amy? Okay, so give me an example of an A where that would happen. Okay, so if A equals 9, that implies that X could be positive 9 or it could be negative 9, right? So we can get two solutions for what kind of values of A? Good. I agree. Right? Regardless of what the positive number is, if you have the absolute value of it, you could have had the positive or negative of it, and you take the absolute value and you get that value of it, right? Okay? What else could happen? What other things, what other kinds of numbers could A be? So we've done what happens when A is positive. What else could A be? Okay. What would happen if A is negative? So let's just pick negative 9, for example. If A is negative 9, what does that mean? Can an absolute value give us a negative? No. So what would we say? we'd get no solution, right? Because you can't take the absolute value of a number and get a negative back. So you could have zero solutions when A is negative. Everybody's okay with that idea. Now there's one other possible value for A that we haven't talked about yet. Mackenzie? Zero. So if A equals zero, what would my answer for the absolute value of X have to be? Have to be zero. So unlike solving a linear equation, which all of us remember doing in our algebra and pre-algebra classes, where you could have only one answer. If I solve an absolute value equation, I could have two answers. I could have one answer. I could have zero answers. You're not going to necessarily know just by looking at the equation which one of those three outcomes you're going to get. Is everybody okay there? Okay. So, an important thing can happen when solving an absolute value equation. we can get something that's called an extraneous solution. So what does that mean? An extraneous solution is an apparent, oops, an apparent algebraic solution that fails to satisfy the original equation. So what we're saying here is, I have an equation. I solve it using the correct solving algorithm. 
I make no arithmetic mistakes. And at the end, I get the number five, x equals 5. If I go then and plug that back into the original equation, and I evaluate, the two sides of my equation are not equal at the end. Now, I didn't make any mistake along the way. What I found here is called an extraneous solution. It's something that is an apparent algebraic solution, but doesn't actually satisfy the equation. Next time we meet, we'll talk, get into talking about why that's happening here. Um, but it's kind of a longer discussion than I want to have today. But next time when we meet, we'll talk about why that's happening here. And it's never happened for us before when we did any other solving. Is that okay? Okay. And we'll look at an example of this happening here in a moment. So when solving an Apsval equation, we're going to use the reverse order of operations, just like we do whenever we do solving. So when we solve, we're going to start on the right-hand side with undoing addition and subtraction. If we're simplifying, we start at the left-hand side by working from the parentheses outward. And remember how we talked at one point that some people call this um, use an M or an O there instead of an E? So the O is where the absolute value goes. So that's when we do or undo an absolute value. Okay, so far? All right. So let's do an example here. Um. Okay. So the first thing I'd want to do is so if we're working from the reverse out of order of operations, we'd want to do undo any addition or subtraction. Well, I see subtraction here and I see addition here. Now, the plus 6 is inside of the absolute value, so I can't undo that until I've cleared off the absolute value. So that's not what I'd want to do first. What I need to do first is get rid of this minus 7. How would I get rid of the minus 7? Yeah, I just add 7 to both sides, right? Is everybody okay there? What should I do next? I would divide by negative 5. And now I have just the absolute value left on the left-hand side. So how would I undo an absolute value? Well, an absolute value is not a number, so it's not like we can just subtract it away. Here's the answer, guys. I have to go all the way back. To my piecewise definition. 
So what the piecewise definition allows me to do is I'm going to split this absolute value equation into two linear pieces. One piece where the answer is positive and one piece where the answer is negative. Every time we solve an absolute value equation, to eliminate the absolute value symbol, we split it into two pieces. We're always going to have one piece that's identical, except it doesn't have the absolute value symbol. And then one piece where we take the right-hand side and we negate it. Now, in the case where the right-hand side is just a single number, just it's negative 2. But I'm going to write it this way because we're going to see an example here in a moment where making sure that we're negating the entire right-hand side becomes important. Okay? Now from here, we can just solve each of these two equations separately. Am I done? No. What do I need to do? I do not need to make them positive. I need to check them because maybe one of these or both of these is extraneous and they are not actually solutions. So to check them, I'm going to plug them back into the original equation. So all the way back here to the beginning. Five, six, seven. And now I'm just going to evaluate and see if I get the same thing on both sides. So I see that negative 4 works. And I see that negative 8 works. So this one has two solutions. Is everybody okay there? Edmund? So you just cross off the one and only circle one of them and put an X through the other one. That would be fine. Or if they both don't work, you cross them both out and then write no solution. That would be fine also. Does everybody feel okay so far? We'll do a couple more examples of doing this. Um, while not tremendously difficult, it's definitely new. So it's worth uh, doing some more examples. Oh, that's no problem. Bye, Gisela. Bye, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. What should we do here first? Subtract 10. Very good. And then what? Divide by 2. And then what? OK. Does anybody object to splitting it here? Okay, that's fine. 
and we'll just keep on going then, right? Okay, and then we better do our check. I have to remember what the original was here. Two ten four. Okay, so let's see. It's 8 plus 5, so that's 13. And right away we can see that that's not going to give us 4. So this one is out. So that's 7, 2 times 7 plus 10. And again, right away I can see that's not going to give me 4. So that's out. So I can say no solution. There was a quicker way of doing this. Can I point out, again, this spot before we split? What do you notice here? Yeah, the absolute value is equal to a negative, right? Right from there, I can say no solution and stop. Now, if you miss that, which is very easy to do, right, particularly if you're in a stressful setting like you're doing a test, it's very easy to blow right past that step. But if you make sure you check, you'll catch the no solution still. But if you get to that step and you notice that, you can certainly stop right there and just say no solution. Everybody's okay with that? All right, good, and then I want to go, I need to steal the example from third hour that I used because I want something specific that's not easy to generate um, from whole cloth. i just steal this example real quick. Okay, one more solving example, and then we'll kind of continue on. Okay. So this one, what would you want to do first here? Add three, we wanna isolate the absolute value part by itself, because that's how we, we need the absolute value by itself in order to do the split and get rid of the absolute value. Everybody good there? And now that the absolute value is by it, we can split. So one split, nothing happens other than dropping the absolute values. And the other split, we negate the entire right-hand side. So here it was very important that I put the parenthesis there because what does it mean when I have a negative sign in front of the parenthesis like that? Yeah, is that they're all multiplied by negative one. I have to distribute that negative through the entire quantity there. Very easy to forget to do that. That's why I'm making a big deal about it, pointing it out. 
It's probably the number one, you know, a, a number one mistake that students make when doing these kind of solving problems is they forget to distribute in a situation like that. Um, but from here, everything else is fairly straightforward. So I'll move everything onto one or onto the x's on one side and stuff on the other. Everybody okay there? I did two steps in one line there. I hope everybody's okay with that. Still need to check though. So let's see, uh, negative 4 plus 6 is 2, the absolute value of 2 is 2, 2 times negative 4 is negative 8 plus 7, so I have negative 1 equals negative 1. So that solution is okay. Uh, here, let's see, I have 16 thirds plus 6, 6 is the same thing as 18 thirds. So that gives me 2 thirds minus 3 equals uh, negative 2 times 16 over 3 is negative 32 over 3 and plus 7. Uh, absolute value of 2 thirds is just 2 thirds. And then 3 or 2 thirds minus 3 is the same thing as 2 thirds minus 9 thirds. So that's negative 7 thirds. And negative 32 over 3 plus 7 is the same thing as negative 32 over 3 plus 21 over 3, which is negative 11 thirds. Those two are not equal. So that one is extraneous. Amy. Well, Here's what I would say. I would say if you can write an exact decimal for it, go ahead. The fact that this is an infinite decimal and you'd have to do some rounding, I'd prefer you to leave it as a fraction. Um, and in general, for like the test or whatever, you could do all of this on the calculator. That's fine with me. Like you don't have to write down the checking. I'm writing it down because it's notes. But you could type the two, you know, one side in your calculator and the other side and just press enter and see if you get the same decimal. That's fine. Um, and coming up with this should have been no problem, right? But messing around with all the fractions in your head is kind of tedious, and you don't need to do that on a test or whatever. I'm doing it now because, well, it's not that tedious for me, and I think it helps to see everything written out on what I'm doing for the check. Um, in notes, right? Is that, is that, I know I didn't answer your question maybe the way you were hoping, but I think it was probably good enough. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, everybody feel okay? We've seen one example of each of the situations, right, where you can get two solutions, zero solution, and one solution. Um, in general, let me tell you this. The only way that we're going to get one solution is a situation where we have x is inside the absolute value and outside the absolute value. Unless you have a situation like that, you're either going to get 2 or 0. If there's x in only one place, you're going to get two solutions or zero solutions. You can't get one. Well, unless it's like equal to 0. I guess you can get one. But you can't get one and have it be extraneous. Let me put it that way. 
So this has, you have to have this situation to get one solution and one extraneous solution. If you have x in just one place, you're going to either get two solutions, one solution and zero extraneous, or zero solutions. Again, I want to make sure I'm being precise there. You can get one solution, but it's going to be like you have the absolute value of stuff equals zero. So when you do the split, you just get the same equation two times. Okay. Um, So next thing we'll do is we'll talk about solving absolute value inequalities. You remember solving inequalities in your algebra class? Linear inequalities? Yeah, you probably did. What's the one thing that you had to really be careful about when solving inequalities? Yeah, what happens? Okay. Okay, so if we divide or multiply by negative, we um, flip the inequality. So just as a reminder there, again, that's easy to forget to do, especially when it's been a couple of years since we've worried about inequalities and how to solve them. So we should just make mention of that real quick, but I think after being reminded, you'll remember to do that. Okay. So we'll approach this basically the same way. There's one little alteration that we make, but we'll talk about that when we get there. First step I would do, do is it any different? What should I do first? Add six. And then what do you want to do? Divide by negative 3. Okay. That's correct. Oops. And then, oh, thank you. Glad you're paying attention. And then what should we do? Okay, so, so let's do this then. Um, I'm going to do that. Now there's no problem, right? Because an absolute value can surely be greater than or equal to a negative. Okay. So fair, fair point. Fair point. We'll just change that. So we'll break this into two. Yes? Okay. So the first one, we don't do anything except get rid of the absolute value part. The second one will negate the right-hand side and switch the inequality symbol. Everybody okay there? So that's the only other difference between dealing with an inequality versus solving.
Everybody so far so good here? Now, when we have two inequalities like this, we need to decide is this an and inequality or is it an or inequality? The easiest way to do that is to graph these two inequalities on the same number line. So here's negative 13 over 2, is, or x is greater than or equal to negative 13 over 2. And then x is less than or equal to negative 1 half. Are you okay here with what I just graphed? Remember doing this in your algebra or pre-algebra course? Drawing the inequalities on a number line like this. Remember I used the filled in circle because of the or equal to inequality, right? So when the both arrows are pointing at each other like this, maybe we'll draw it like that. This is the and inequality. So we can write this as... Um, negative 13 over 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to negative 1 half. If the arrows both point away from each other, that would be the or situation. If the arrows are both pointing the same way, you made a mistake. The likely places where you made a mistake was forgetting to flip the inequality probably at the split, would be where that happened. Edmund? So it's always on the negative side and split it is when you uh, include the negative Yes. Yes, correct. So whenever the side that gets negated is the one that also gets the inequality flip every time. Let's do one more. Um, but again, not significantly different than just the solving an equation, right? There's a couple of little details that are a little bit different, but not too bad. Okay. What do you want to do first? Yep, subtract the 8. Okay. And then what? Divide by 2. Okay. And then split. What's the first inequality? 10 minus x is less than 3. And what's the second inequality? Good. So 10 minus x is greater than negative 3 is the second one. And then we just continue solving. So we'll subtract 10. And then when we divide by negative 1, what do we have to remember here? Yeah, flip the inequality again. So x is greater than 7 and less than 13. Since they're again pointing at each other, that's an and. I meant that to go the other way because I wanted an or in this example, but oh well. You ever make a mistake when you had something planned out? Like, oh, this will work. And then it was like, oh. Thought really hard about this and I goofed it up anyways, huh? Amy. Sure. 
So I start at seven because it's a strict inequality. I drew the open circle. So I read this X is greater than seven. So the places where the numbers bigger than seven are to the right. So I drew my arrow to the right. And then for the other one, I have 13. So I start at 13 with the open circle because it's a strict inequality. And if I read this, it says X is less than 13. The numbers less than 13 are to the left. So I drew my arrow to the left. And if the arrows are pointing at each other, that's the and situation. If they're going away from each other, that's the or situation. If we had that situation, so just this is what it would look like. And the final answer you'd write here just has the word or in between the two inequalities. So we didn't do a solving one that ended with an or, but we should at least talk about what, that's, what that would look like and what your final answer would look like in that case. What do you guys think here? Not too bad, I hope, right? I think probably considerably more comfortable feeling than what we've been doing previously. This looks a lot more like the algebra that you've been used to. So that's good at least, right? Okay. So let's now move on to graphing. Okay. So remember from last chapter, we had any transformation could be written, or transformation of the function f of x could be written in this form. Where we had our transformation and our parent function. In this chapter, the parent function is going to be the simplest version of an absolute value function. Well, the simplest version of an absolute value function would just be y equals the absolute value of x. So our g of x for this chapter is going to be g of x equals a times the absolute value of 1 over b times x minus h plus k. Is everybody okay here? Notice here, if I look at that g of x, there's some simplifying I can do. Because I have two things being multiplied together inside the absolute value. I can do that, right? And since b is a constant, I can just kind of take it off like there and drop the absolute value around it. So what is this result telling us? Anything that B does, like a horizontal stretch or shrink, can be represented with a vertical stretch or shrink. In other words, we don't need a B at all.
Okay with that? So this is our transformation for an absolute value function that we'll use in this chapter. We're able to get rid of the B altogether because it turns out it can do this, A can do the same thing that B can. So we don't need to think about them separately. They're just one thing. So in my parent function then, If I wanted to try to graph this, I could make myself an xy table. So if x is negative 1, y becomes positive 1. If x is 0, y is 0. And if x is 1, y is 1. So I'd have a graph that looks like this feed, right? What's the domain for this graph, or for this function? Sergio? Well, we're looking at the graph, not just the three points. Oh, negative infinity and positive infinity. Very good. That's OK. You, you got there. You didn't even need much prompting to get there. And the range. Or someone else. I mean, if you have an idea, you can certainly shout it out. Uh, be... oh, yeah. yeah, zero to positive infinity. And then for the zero, we should have a bracket there because we do have the point that has a y coordinate zero. It's sitting right there. So if I wanted to say graph, y equals negative 2x plus 3 my, or plus 1. I'm going to start by identifying the values for a, h, and k. My value for a here would be negative 2. And the value for h would be negative 3. Remember, the h is always the opposite sign of what it appears. And the value for k is 1. So I'm going to use my transformation map from last time. But remember, there's no x's. I'm sorry, there's no b's in this transformation, so I don't have to worry about that. So in this case, when I plug things in, I have x minus 3 negative 2y plus 1. And I'm going to use those three points from the parent function always these three points from the parent function and find my three new transform points. Everybody okay there? Yes, Zach. You said that the h is always the opposite of the sign. If it was x minus 3, would it still be negative 3? It would be positive 3 then. Oh, okay. Because we're looking at this guy here. If I plug positive 3 into that, you'd have x minus 3. Yeah. Okay. Good questions. So if I graph this, then I have negative 4, negative 1, oops, negative 4, negative 1, negative 3, positive 1, and negative 2, negative 1. So there's my new graph. For this graph, what would the domain be? Sergio? That's correct. 
And what would the range be? So, so one. Mm -hmm. in that, uh, that'd be in a bracket. In that, uh, Except we go small to big. Uh, so uh, negative yeah. infinity should come first. But you're correct. Is everybody okay there? So that's it as far as the graphing goes. You're just going to do it the same way we did last chapter. Can we take this domain and range and come up with a general rule for it? So if I go back up to my transformation, what can we say about the domain for any transformation of an absolute value function? If what we're transforming had the domain negative infinity to positive infinity, if I stretch it or if I shift it or if I reflect it, can the domain get any smaller than that? No. The domain's always going to stay there. Okay? For the parent function, the range was 0 to positive infinity. If I multiply that y coordinate by something, is the range going to change? Multiply 0 to 0, stay 0. And multiply something to infinity, it still stays infinity, right? Everybody's okay there? So multiplying by a number can't stretch this out any. What can happen, though, is if I multiply by a negative, it could flip, right? Where it, all of a sudden it'd be pointing down. So that matters. So if A is positive, we're going to get one. If it's negative, we're going to get the other. Everybody's okay there. Good. Last thing, the range could also change if we're shifting up or down, right? If the range was zero to positive infinity and we go up two, it would now become two to positive infinity, right? The K controls that, shifting up and down. So that's where we're at. Yes, all of these g of x's, we can find the domain and range using those rules that we just outlined there. Which is marvelous, right? To have a set rule of finding the domain and range. I don't have to think about it really at all. I just have to apply the rule. We need to stop because I think we're almost out of time here. Um, I want to point out to you guys, I have put three assignments here on the um, content library. So there's a solving assignment. There's a graphing assignment. And this one we're not ready to do yet. So we meet again Friday, right? Friday we'll talk about graphing inequalities in two variables and kind of what that means. Um, and then we have to talk about modeling, and that'll do it for Chapter 2. So we're probably looking at a Chapter 2 test next week, just as a heads up. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, we'll see what we get through on Friday. But the first two you should be able to do. And again, like some of them are going to be really quite quick, quite easy. Um, the solving one shouldn't take a whole lot of time to do most of these. Right? That was pretty relatively straightforward. And there's four graphs that I ask you to draw. So should be not too bad there. No, no. In general, I think this chapter is considerably less abstract and I think easier conceptually for most students. We did a lot of hard work in the last chapter to kind of get us ready to make the next few chapters much easier as a result. Um, so, yeah, probably uh, not rare. I would say rarely, very no, rarely. I studied that and I was like, I'm happy <laughs> Well, I'm glad I could help you out there with that. Again, I, I don't mind giving you guys hard stuff in the homework, but when it comes to the test, I'm going to be a little bit more selective of not taking like the hardest things that we did or the, the most abstract things that we did. I'd rather take the things that I know are going to be important going forward. Like, can you write 
intervals to describe things? Can you find domains and ranges? Can you tell me if something's a function or not? Can you do a transformation? Like those are things that have immediate, you know, like immediately followed through to the next several chapters rather than just pulling all the hardest things. Why do we say so 